Hi, today's theme is unwrapping your gifts. I know that's a play on words because it's about, you know, like at Christmas where you receive gifts and you unwrap them. But this is also about the unveiling of the different manifestations, gifts of the Holy Spirit and charismas that God has put in each of our lives. I firmly believe that it's impossible to get into this planet without a gift, without a talent, without some deposit from God and some plan in his mind of how he wants to use you in conjunction with others in his body. And today our background scripture is coming from Romans chapter 12 verses 3 to 6 where the Apostle Paul wrote these words. For I say through the grace given to me. In other words, this is his charisma or his grace. And I put the word grace and charisma there together because the word grace is the word charis in Greek from which we get the word charisma or charismatic. To everyone who is among you, Paul says, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is urging us to understand who God created us to be, what gifts, what talents, what abilities, what charismas and what anointings and what assignments he has put in our life and called us to so that we can make a correct estimate of who we are and how we fit in with everybody else. Amen. And it's a good reason for that because if we all find our place, we won't have to clamor for position. We won't have to fight someone for title or feel we're in a competition. We just flow in our God-given gift. And part of the body of Christ, there are people who can help with this, help get us where we're gifted to be. And when we're there, we can serve with energy and we don't burn out. We energize as we do it. Amen. Verse 4, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. And I think Rosanna said it last week, God is the perfect example of this because he's three persons in one. It's known as the doctrine of the Trinity, but as three persons in one. Three persons, maybe with different gift or different functions, but who are so completely unified in vision, in purpose, and in understanding who they are, who each other is, and how they work together, that for all intents and purposes, you could look at them and say they are one, because together they function together. And it's like when Rosanna and I used to play in music teams, and we still do in church, but each member of the music team has a given function. I'm a bass player. Rosanna plays guitar and sings. We used to work with a drummer. And when I play bass, I don't try to play guitar. I don't try to play drums. I don't try to make my bass the lead singer. It's got a job to do. And so I focus on doing that job. The drummer plays his drums and he definitely wasn't trying to sing. And Rosanna was singing. She wasn't trying to play drums at the same time. But the overall impact was one song sounding together with great impact. Amen. So each one of us in the body of Christ have been given gifts, abilities and charismas from God to go with our specific and unique anointing and function and assignment in him. So in other words, when God created you, he equipped you with the gifts, the talents, the abilities, the charismas you need when you're born again to be able to fulfill the plan that you and he agreed on before you came to this planet. You know, in Jeremiah, it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. It implies there was an intimacy and knowledge, an, an intimate knowledge of who we are, who he is. And then he sent us, like his own son, into this planet with an assignment. He deployed us into this planet. And when we get here, we don't put the gifts in us, but it's our job to find or discover the gifts that God put in us to discover our assignment. And this can be done with the help of others 
in the body of Christ. Those that will see what God has done will recognize it. And part of the prophet's gift is to be able to affirm it. Like not even Jesus began his ministry until the prophet John the Baptist pointed to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus needed a prophet to affirm and to underline the ministry to which God had called him. How much more do all of we? And Paul says it, stir up the gift that's in you, which was given you by prophecy and the laying on of the hands of the elders. Amen. So these things work in conjunction with the body. But apart from that, every one of us is born with natural talents, natural abilities, and what we call natural motivational gifts. And those motivations are in you all of your life. And it can lead to great frustration and great emptiness and a great chasing after the wind, as the book of Ecclesiastes call it, until you come into your God-given assignment and flow in the unique part that God has for you. The other good thing about this is when you come into the unique position and calling God has for you, then you're not ever in competition with anybody. You're not functioning out of your own strength. So you're not going to burn out. You're not going to wear out. And you're not going to fight anybody for your position or what you do. Because if everybody is led into what God created them to be and to do, the body will fit together and everyone has a completely fulfilling function and role in the body and so does everybody else. And then as I said in the last few weeks, my strengths compensate for somebody else's weaknesses, but in turn somebody else's strengths compensate for where I'm either weak or not gifted. Like I love playing music, I even love singing, but I'm not a lead singer. And the band would look very silly with just a drummer and a bass player. <laughs> it would be very boring. But with Rosanna there, it makes sense because what she's really good at, none of us could do. But then again, when it came to unloading the truck and driving the truck, I'm sure she wasn't very strengthened in those areas either, but we could do it. Amen. So together we made a ministry. And you'll notice that Rosanna and I together make a ministry to this day. Amen. So what does he say here in this chapter? In verse 6 he says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Paul is encouraging us to use the gift that's in our life. And whatever gift is in your life, you might not even see it because often your greatest gift is is one you don't notice because it comes so naturally to you. Amen. They used to ask this question. If you didn't have to work to earn money, what would you love to do with your life? What do you love? When you're in church, what do you notice? What would you notice if it wasn't done properly? We used to go to conferences when we were first Christians. And every time we went, we noticed that the sound equipment wasn't working properly. And there would be feedback and noises and all kinds of problems and everyone trying to get it fixed. That's what we noticed because we were professionals in that area and we just felt we could contribute something. And so it's the same with you. Do you notice the children? Maybe you're called to kids church. Do you notice the young people and think something has to be done with these youth? Do you look at the elderly and wish you could reach out and encourage them and help them and show them that they still have a purpose? Do you see the young families and the, and the marrieds? Do you hear about marriages that aren't working right and want them fixed? Do you see the way things are done in church and just wish you could help in this area or that area? It could be a hint to a gift and an assignment that's in your life. It's not put there to turn you into a critic. It's put there so that you can be the solution to a problem. Amen. So let's pray. Father, as we open the word and as we open this topic today, we pray and ask that you would flood us with revelation, with understanding, so that we won't be know-alls, but so that we can help ourselves and others get into the God-assigned place for us and for each other 
and operate in the gifts that you've put in our lives. Father, we pray today that you would bring great revelation in this area so that we could all understand it today in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to encourage you today, if you will give focus to the Word of God and give your attention to this online service, by the time we finish today, you can see that God is at work and he will help you discover the gift he has invested in you. Amen. He will help you show you how to develop that gift and he will help you see to the gift being deployed and used. And then when you understand it and how they fit together, you'll find it a joy to look for it in others and help them into their gift so that you're not criticizing people trying to do things for which they're not gifted but you'll be celebrating and rejoicing in the Holy Spirit's amazing creativity when you see a gift in operation or you see somebody getting into a role for which they're gifted and purposed. And I know in many of our lives from past experience, we could be tempted right now to be cynical about this, but we don't have to be because God has a plan for you. Amen. Before we really get into the Bible's gifts, and lists. Let's talk about the ones that the world has, because most of us have heard of these, and to some degree they are valuable and they're a little bit useful, but they are not the lists and the categories God created. God is the designer and the creator of the human beings, and he gave us the lists that are in the Bible to help us. And if we don't use those lists, but call upon the world's lists, it will always lead to certain levels of frustration. So you may have heard words like choleric, sanguine, melancholic, and phlegmatic. Helpful, but not God's system. What about the explanation that came out? The beaver, the otter, the golden retriever, and the German shepherd. Again, helpful, but not God's system. Some people divide people up into four groups, and there's the feeling, the judging, the perceiving, and the intuitive. Again, helpful. I'm not criticizing it but it's not the system God instituted. Remember, he is the genius. And so throughout the Bible, to help us understand what he's done, what we are like and what's our life about, he has given us a few different lists to help us understand this. So let's move on to what he said. First of all, the background is that Jesus has called us collectively to his great commission. Could be summarized like this. Go and win everybody to Jesus, take over all roles of leadership and get all property for Jesus, right? Because he is the heir of all things. He is the name above every name. And he commissioned us to go into all the world, preach the gospel to everyone and to do as much as you can to evangelize and disciple the world. Obviously, it can't be done by one individual. That's a collective commission. But then it can come down to a country, a movement of churches, or to a local church, which then has within the commission its own local mission, which then becomes a vision, and the vision becomes a strategy, and the strategy has to revolve around the gifts and the callings and the assignments that God has placed in individuals, bringing them together to work together as a local body of Christ. Amen? So in this process, Jesus gets us born again so that we can see the kingdom of God. We can enter the kingdom of God. He fills us with the Holy Spirit inside for relationship to guide us. He baptizes us in the Holy Spirit for supernatural power, clothing on the outside, enabling the gifts of the Spirit and the anointings of God to work in us. And then to his disciples, to his followers, his angels, and with the Holy Spirit's help, he imparts his vision. He delegates his authority through us operating in the living word of God, and he pours out his power. And then his angels are here. It says the angels are all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who are the heirs of his kingdom. So we're talking about something very, very supernatural being the local church. There are angels assigned to it. 
there are supernatural gifts and anointings. And when there is a pastor present or a leader or a group of elders and oversight is formed and the oversight form a covering, a covering of grace and anointings under which everybody can come into their place and become fulfilled and operate and function. If you try to step outside that covering, do things on your own or that are not sanctioned by the vision of the local church as it's given to the overseers and the leaders, you will run into all kinds of problems. You're outside the realm of safety and you get outside the realm of God's grace and enabling. Because remember, God speaks to us against operating in your own human strength. And to clarify this, well, really not very clear, but it says near the end of the book of Psalms, the Lord takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. Now, that doesn't mean don't wear shorts on a hot day. What it means is it's not the strength or the natural ability in someone that God's looking for to build his kingdom. Amen. It cannot be done with flesh and blood. It's done by charismas, by gifts, by the anointing and by the supernatural placement of people where God has called them to be. Amen. So what are these different lists of gifts brought up in the Bible? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we read about the nine charismatic gifts. And it's probably better to call them nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And remember, charismatic is to do with the caress or the grace of God. That grace is something that's supernaturally given that empowers us. Remember, grace is not an exchange word for mercy. Mercy is when God forgives us. But grace can be better understood when we look at the Apostle Paul saying, By the grace of God, I labored more abundantly than you all. Grace enabled him to work in his ministry. And Jesus also depicts grace in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he wants to yield to his Father's will, but everything in his flesh has an aversion to being arrested, whipped, false trial, wrongful imprisonment, and then death on the cross. Everything's against that. So he prayed and he prayed. And then the Bible says an angel was seen from heaven strengthening him. And when he got up from that strengthening him, he was able to go to the cross without fighting. You know, like a lamb led to the slaughter. He didn't open his mouth. Why? Because grace enabled him to fulfill God's will. And grace is available for you under that covering, in your place, in your role as affirmed and confirmed in the church by the overseers and by the ones with prophetic voices. This is your destiny and this is how you can be fulfilled. And as a result, you'll be doing what you love operating in things you enjoy and you'll be energized by it and the church will grow because this is how Jesus designed his church. Amen. So in these nine charismatic manifestations of the Holy Spirit, there are three of them which are vocal, which is the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues and the gift that enables the interpretation of tongues. There is also three of them that are revelation type gifts. There's a word of knowledge, the word of wisdom and the gift of the discerning or seeing good and evil spirits. It's not just discerning what's going on in someone. That's, there's no gift like that in the Bible, except one which I'll mention today. It's the discerning of good and evil spirits. And there's three supernatural power gifts or demonstration gifts mentioned among these nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And there's the gift of faith, which is a supernatural faith from heaven. Can be used in a lot of areas, but it might be used by a leader who wants to plant a new church, build a new building, start a new ministry, where nothing can be seen with the natural eye. And yet the person who has this gift is convinced that this is possible. Amen. There's gifts, plural, of healings, plural, can operate in all kinds of ways. And there's the gift of the working of miracles. But clearly the Bible says these nine gifts are not the possession of the person through whom they operate, 
because they are not ever given to the person. That's why the word gift is misleading. They are manifestations of the Holy Spirit as he wills on and or through that person. Amen. So this is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Now, in a group of people, there's always someone that is more likely to use in prophecy. Someone may be used to giving messages in tongues. Someone may be used in the gift of healing more regularly, but it's not them that owns the gift. It's the Holy Spirit who does. And the more you are in relationship with him, the more he will use you the way God used you to let these manifestations flow in and through your life. Amen. This is great fulfillment. Praise the Lord. You know, it reminds you of that story in the Bible where Jesus was on his way to heal the leader of the synagogue's daughter. She died when he was on the way and the woman with the issue of blood stopped him. And then because of the delay or whatever, the young girl died. And so they said to the leader of the synagogue, don't bother Jesus anymore. In other words, they thought it was going to be bothersome to Jesus to do a miracle. But I want to tell you right now, if you have ever been used by Jesus in the gift of miracles or healing or in any of these gifts, you'll find that it's not bothersome. And please excuse the expression. If anything, it's addictive because we love it. We love being involved with this. Yes, it's a bit nerve wracking. Yes, you've got to depend on God. Yes, you've got to step out and launch out by faith. But when it works, you don't go home exhausted and tired like a day of shoveling concrete. You go home energized, can't wait for the next opportunity. Amen. It's not bothersome. It won't wear you out. This is your destiny and what you're created for. And remember, it can work in the home and it can work in the workplace. I know a young lady that's well, I'd consider her a prophet or a prophet insight. She's a great intercessor, very insightful. And I said to her one day, I said, what's it like being a prophet and working in construction? I thought, you know, these things are so diametrically opposed. I can't see how a prophet could work in a job like that and somehow not feel a dichotomy or feel like two persons. But she said, oh, yeah, she said it's very good. And she's working on huge construction sites like she was helping to supervise the building of a great big building at the Gold Coast. And the boss said to her, organize for the concrete to come on Tuesday and pour the concrete. And she prayed and she felt from God, no, bring it on Thursday. So she changed it. She, she ordered it for Thursday. And later the boss comes in and says, oh, I'm so glad you ordered that for Thursday. We weren't ready on Tuesday. Amen. And so the gifts of the spirit out there on the job can change everything. Look at Daniel. Daniel was cornered in the old days by the greatest king of the greatest empire known on this planet. And yet because he learned how to operate in the gifts of the spirit, you could say, at church, he was able to do things that brought Nebuchadnezzar from wanting everyone to worship him to being someone that respected and feared the God of the universe. And then after Nebuchadnezzar, his son came and Daniel again rose because of the gifts of the spirit. And he brought Belteshazzar to send out a letter telling everybody in his empire to fear the God of Daniel and the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Amen. He brought his whole kingdom and empire to acknowledging and believing in God simply because as a youngster at church, he learned how to operate in the gifts of the spirit. Can I encourage you today? You need to discover, you need to develop and deploy these gifts and they do not stop at the front door of the church. You can use it all day, every day, wherever you are. Amen. Then, of course, in the Bible, in Ephesians chapter four, there are five ministry gifts. He gave some to be apostles, which is somebody sent with a commission. He gave some to be prophets. A prophet then is slightly different from someone who can prophesy, because in the book of Acts, we find Philip had four daughters who prophesied, but they were visited by Agabus, the prophet. And so there was a difference between those who prophesy and someone called here to be a prophet. I haven't got time on that today, but we will unfold it at some point. There are those who are gifted to be evangelists. And then there are pastors and there are teachers, or as some like to put it, there are pastors 
and teachers because of the Greek construction. They say there's not a lot of, you can't make that as a list, they're joined together. I'm not sure about that because the Aramaic is always different, but you can clearly see some people are gifted to be pastors. I've got a friend like that. He can pastor and do the pastoral care for a big church by himself. Eight o'clock in the morning, he goes with this. Hello, Pastor Ronald here today. How are you? Five o'clock before he goes home. Hello, Pastor Ronald here today. How are you? And his wife said, yeah, up until 10 o'clock. Hello, Pastor Ronald here. How are you today? And he just has that supernatural energy to do that all day, every day. He loves everybody. He's now pastoring his own church, which is several hundred people, but he doesn't even seem to need an assistant pastor because of his amazing capacities. He's a pastor. My brother-in-law was a pastor. 24 hours a day, he was focused on the church, the church, the church. And he just had his phone with him all the time and he's always on the phone to people. He was a pastor's pastor. Amazing. And I'm sure you've seen real pastors. A teacher, on the other hand, is a totally different person in the way I see it. And I'll explain some more about this because the next list we have is called the motivational gifts. And I'm going to ask Rosanna to come and help with this in a minute. So I'm skipping that one over to this one called just some other gifts that are listed. And we see in there the gift of helps. You know, Paul says, first in the church, there is apostles, secondarily prophets. After that, the working of miracles, the gift of helps and administrations. Also mentioned in the New Testament is hospitality. I used to be the coordinator of the home groups in a big church. And my job was to go from house to house and look at the groups they had. And I realized that for a home group to succeed, you might call it a connect group, a cell group, a house church, whatever. It has to be in the home of somebody with the gift of hospitality and without prejudice and without ever criticizing anybody who doesn't have it. Because remember, it's a God given gift. You can't make it if you don't get it from God. Amen. I just used to visit people in their homes. You could tell straight away if they've got the gift of hospitality. And if they do, everybody that comes into that home will feel at home. They will feel loved and accepted. There's one that's called the gift of the psalmist, possibly seen these days in the musicians that help in church. And in the Old Testament, there's one called the seer, which, as the Bible says in 1 Samuel 9, 9, was what they called a prophet before they changed it to calling them a prophet. Okay. Today, I'm going to ask Rosanna to help me explain some of these gifts. Now, this comes out of Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 8. I'm reading it again. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So you might see Rosanna or someone leading worship and say, oh, I really would like to do that. But if you don't have a gift in your life from God to do it, you will frustrate yourself, you'll frustrate the music team, and you'll frustrate the congregation. But if you've got the gift from God, you will be able to do it. People will know it. You'll never have to fight for position. They'll want you doing it, and they'll make room for you, and everything will just flow and work. But if that's not your gift, Remember, you didn't get into this planet from God without a gift. We just need to help you discover what it is, help you develop it, and then deploy it because you've got a gift somewhere. It's not easy to see your own gift. I'll repeat that as many times as I can. You don't always see your strongest gift. That's why I've made it one of my policies in life is whenever I see a gift in someone, I say it, I underline it. I try not to jump the gun by saying it before I'm sure, but I want people to know because often you can go through your life without ever having it very clearly spelled out to you. This is your gift. This is where you are a blessing, even though it might seem like it's so easy or effortless to you. How does Rosanna learn to sing a song? She just listens to it. Mm -hmm, you know, and after a while she can sing it. I don't know how she does that. And when I'm learning how to play bass, I just listen to the track a few times. Oh, he does that, 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 that. One of them, a couple of them, one of these. Right, got it. We had one piano player that was like that. We wanted him to learn a new song. And he used to play left hand piano, grand piano, right hand, synthesize and do all the lead parts. And we went round to show him a new song. 
And I remember this, he just sat down, he listened to the song, he read the chart and he goes, yep, 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 got that. And he didn't even practice it. He learned it like that. And I'm going down thinking, that's not fair. But it's a gift. Amen. And when he played in church, everyone's blessed. Everyone's blessed because he had a gift from God. Amen. Some people are great at greeting on the door. Some people are just brilliant at doing serving time. Anyway, let's get into this. Here we go. The first one is called the gift of mercy. Not to be mixed up with the idea of grace, which really the definition of grace is God's influence on the heart and its effect in the life. Grace will change you and empower you. Mercy is more like forgiveness. Amen. When you need mercy or you need God to overlook sin, you beg for mercy. But when you need the ability to live free of sin, you need grace, which is not another word for mercy, but God's empowering to change you, to make you work hard, to bring the gifts of the Spirit into your life and to let you flow under the grace. Even the world system recognize that some leaders are called charismatic because they have an inherent ability that rises up in time of a crisis and they know what to do. Amen. The background of this is just say you're in a church and there's a family in the church or maybe a single mum and today we're calling her Mrs. Incapacitated because something's happened to her and she hasn't got any more the capacity to do what she needs to do, possibly sick or out of action for a while. She might have had an operation or a broken leg. And then the notice of this comes to the church and the pastor forms a committee to organize to help her. And one of their tasks is to wash the car of Mrs. Incapacitated. And we're going to look today at how the different gifts listed in this list go about doing it. The first one is the gift of mercy. Let's watch now as Rosanna shows us how the gift of mercy cleans a car. Oh, just got a text. Oh no, it's Mrs. Incapacitated. She's out of action. She can't do her normal work around the house or look after her family. Oh, the poor thing. Oh, I wonder how she's feeling. I'd better clear my calendar and call her. The church is going to wash her car. I'd better pray that no one gets their feelings hurt in the process. I'd better pray tonight for God's angels and protection and for unity. Now, I'll ring Mrs. Incapacitated. Hi, how you doing? I hear you're out of action. How does that make you feel? My heart's so heavy for you. I, I really feel your pain. I really do. I can't imagine how you're coping. Tell me more. Oh, oh gee. I'm sorry to hear that. Mm. Thanks, Rosanna. That was very good. Now, this is what the Bible says about the gift of mercy. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Did you notice at the end how the mercy gift ended up carrying the burdens of Mrs. Incapacitated because she was very good at listening and empathizing with the hurt woman and the incapacitated woman. But instead of showing her how to cast all the care of it on the Lord and praying with her and leaving happy, she took all those burdens and went away very sad and depressed. This is not the right use of the gift, but it may help you recognize that you know someone with this gift, or it may be you. And we must remember this too. Don't use this gift to find a marriage partner. Amen. Clearly see that the gift of mercy, or this is a motivational gift, it's what you're born with. This gift is there to help people unpack their problems and have someone that will listen to them. It's not there for you to find an attachment for marriage. Switch that gift off when it comes to finding a married partner. You need someone that's not full of problems. You need someone that can lift you up when you accidentally take on the problems of other people. Amen. Learn to differentiate between this gift and a parental role too, because 
that children could manipulate someone with this gift by always making them feel sorry for them. That's not what it's there for. Please learn this gift, how to use it, how to make the most of it, and how to really use it to bless people. Because when they start talking to you, you will find that it will be easy for them to offload to you and to let you know their challenges and their problems. And your job is to empathize with them, to listen to them, because catharsis says that as they talk about it, some people are verbal processes, and as they speak about it, they actually solve their own problem. And at the end of which, you encourage them to trust in the Lord, to pray about it together, and then you leave happy and they leave happy. Amen. All right, the next gift in this list that we look at today is called the gift of prophecy in the book of Romans and the New King James, but we are going to call it the prophet insight person because they're born with this as a motivation. Thanks, Rosanna. Show us how this one works to wash a car. I've been praying about this for a long time. God has spoken to my heart and I believe it's a bad witness for him if we have dirty cars. Every Christian should have a car that's squeaky clean, squeaky clean on the outside and spotless on the inside. Oh, before I can point my finger at everyone else, before I can get up and preach this on Sunday, I need to clean my own car. Hmm. How do I do this? Oh, such a huge job. What a huge job. Where do I start? Oh, man. Oh, I'll never get this done. It's so hard. But I know that everyone should have a perfectly clean car. So I'm just going to have to do it. Well, I guess you can see what happens with that gift. They know what's got to be done. And this person with this gift of prophecy, you have to realize, or the prophetic insight, they can see people's motivations. They can see what moves people and they understand a lot of things about people, about God and God's heart. The downside is that they learn to be very suspicious of everybody and they think that there's something wrong with the motives of a lot of people. And truly there is. And, and we've got to do something about fixing it. Often the prophet inside is not too keen on fixing it, just on pointing it out. But the rest of us who aren't prophet insights would be well advised to listen to what they say. Because if they say, I'm feeling uneasy about this person, don't try to rationalize it or analyze it with your intellect. You cannot. It's a gift from God. What you need to do is pray about it as well. And if you're the leader, ask God for wisdom and for more than one witness to confirm this word. And we all need to understand that. The person who is a prophet insight needs to understand that once they've delivered the word, then it should be confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Before I go on, the other downside is that the prophet insight usually doesn't have very many good friends, just one or two, because they find it challenging to find someone that they can trust enough to really share open-heartedly with. And we all have prophet insights in our midst. They are a great gift from God, but it's not an intellectual process of how they come up with their conclusions. They do it by the gift of God. Let me tell you some stories about this. I was in one big church and something was really weird about one of the ladies and it all went pear-shaped and something, was, something bad had happened. I think she was a witchcraft or something like that, trying to infiltrate the church. And one day I was talking to a couple of the prophet insights together and they said, oh, yeah, I could have told you that. And the other one goes, yeah, I knew that too. And I'm thinking, well, why didn't you tell us before? And then I got them together and I got about three of them together or four. And I sat down and I said, is there anybody else you know something about? Tell me now so that we don't have to wait for a disaster. We can avert it before the problem comes. Sure enough, bang, they all named the same name straight away because they have an ability that can look beyond the natural. Prophet insight is a great gift. It's sort of, it's discerning, it's perceptive, it's intuitive. That kind of person is good in prayer. That kind of person would often give a prophecy. Another downside is because they are so attuned and open to the spirit, they're almost like a lightning rod in a thunderstorm. 
they can pick up all the spiritual garbage that's coming from the enemy as well. And something that might not affect you can be crushing to them. So remember then to be around them and encourage them. Amen. So the Bible says here, if prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. We've got to have faith. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. So prophet insights, don't spend your days brooding and musing over some of the things that's wrong with people. Invest your time in building your faith by staying in the word of God until God's faith is in you and then prophesy in proportion to the amount of faith that's in you. And please look for someone to help encourage and build you up. Another thing I can tell you about the prophet is that the prophet is often hardest on themselves. There's nobody like a prophet who knows that when you point the finger at someone, you've actually got three fingers pointing back at yourself. And the prophet will usually apply a lot of these things to themselves. And again, that can cause them to get very down on themselves and discouraged and depressed. Again, it's right to correct yourself, but it's wrong to get it so depressed and discouraged that you become condemned by the prophetic word instead of build up again. Staying in faith is the way to defeat that. Amen. And now Rosanna is going to show us how a contributor washes a car. Thank you, Rosanna. Hmm. Okay. The church is washing a car for Mrs. Incapacitated this Saturday. Well, they can use my driveway. I'll get to the shop and I'll buy some buckets, detergent and a new hose. While I'm there, I'll make sure I've got a good supply of refreshments. <gasps> Ooh, I hope someone turns up who can help in the kitchen. <laughs> this is not me, I tell you. Well, it doesn't matter. I've got to get to the ATM while I'm there and draw out some cash for Mrs. Incapacitated. Plus, I'll put up my hand to take the car back for her. That way, I can make sure it's filled with fuel before we return it. Okay, now contributor is another word for giver. You'll notice that the contributor was willing to offer their house, their resources, their time, and was wanting to make sure that when they took the car back, they had it full of fuel, they had it clean, and they put out all that extra cash in the glove box for Mrs. Disadvantaged or gave it to her in person or whatever, because their motivation is to give. And this person, giving is not like pulling teeth. For them, giving is a pleasure. It's a blessing. They absolutely love it. And that's why they're such good managers of money. And when they give, in some cases, they like to follow the money trail to make sure the money was used correctly. I worked for one pastor that was a giver, and that was good. But when we gave money overseas, he packed me on an aeroplane with a camera and said, you go over and make sure that money gets used the way we gave it to them. You know, it wasn't just put in the offering and bye-bye. We followed the money trail by literally going over to Thailand, filming what they did with it. Then we flew over to Estonia and filmed what they did with the money there. It might have cost nearly as much to send us there to film it as we gave them. But that was one way of making sure that it was used properly. In other words, this person is motivated and very conscientious about the correct use of God's resources. They'll want the accounting done right. They'll want a lot of things done right. But when it lines up, they'll be very generous. Amen. The next one in this list in Romans chapter 12 is the gift or the motivational impartation of being a teacher. Let's look at how a teacher <laughs> washes a car. I'm laughing because I'm sure I've got a lot of this in me. OK, Rosanna, show us how does a teacher wash a car? OK, guys, I've been up half the night researching this challenge. I'll need you all to be there at 8 a.m. sharp on Saturday for a car washing seminar. You'll learn everything you'll ever need to know about the types of contaminants, road bloom, bird droppings, dead bugs, watermarks, etc. Strength of adhesive bonds from pothole spray through oil splash to fruit bat droppings, which is a mixture of super glue and acid. The properties and application of various types of detergents, washing styles, types and techniques, and finally polymers and polishes. Remember to bring something for notes and be there at 8 a.m. sharp. We are going to learn how to do this perfectly and be equipped for all such challenges in the future. Thanks, Rosanna. Isn't that so insightful? And don't all point your finger at me. <laughs> I know that I'm like that. Okay. 
But this is what Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says about the teacher. He who teaches says, operate the grace of God in teaching. One of the great hallmarks of a teacher, especially when they're younger, is their ability to research and learn. My brother has this gift. And you know how we know that's there? Because even when he was a young boy, he would read comic books, or we could call them illustrated storybooks, you know. He used to read comic books and he would memorize the facts that everybody else would zoom past. He knew Florida was south. He knew all of that sort of thing from reading comic books. And one day when we were in Estonia, speaking of our Estonian trip, and we were there and we were trying to find an interpreter and we found one really good interpreter, but all the children that were there couldn't speak English except for one or two words. But there was a young girl there who could speak fluent English and she could just about interpret as well as the interpreter. I said, how come you can speak such good English? And she said, almost implying the proverbial read my lips, cartoon network. In other words, she had such an amazing ability, she could watch the cartoon, read the captions in Estonian, listen to the English, and she learned how to speak English as a young child by doing that. That's a gift of learning. And that gift of learning goes with the teacher. In the Bible, there's one that approached Jesus. And he said, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever I go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, I meditated on this for a long time, and I realized that the scribe was like a teacher. He loved studying. He loved learning. He loved his books, and he had his office or his study all set up with his books and all that kind of thing. He had his place to do what he was gifted to do, and he probably loved it. Then he said to Jesus, I'll follow you. And Jesus thinking, well, we're all about to get in a boat go through a storm, we're going over to a demon-possessed territory, we're going to be terrorized by two demon-possessed men. Are you sure you want to come on this? We're going to have 12 or 13 of us in one boat. Remember, when you're all in the same boat, only it takes one to rock it and everyone's in peril. Jesus said, listen, mate, it's not going to be so easy for you. Your work's inside your study. And so what Jesus is telling us here is if you are a teacher, by all means, do your research but it can't stop there. You have to take it out and teach. And you don't learn all that knowledge to be a know-it-all, to put others down, to climb above them as it does in the world, climbing the world system of relative standing by how much knowledge you have. You use it in the body of Christ to serve people, to give them the knowledge they need in the amount they need when they need it. And another heads up on this, the more you learn about God's word, never overlook the psalm that says he sent his word to try them and tested them. Amen. God's word will test us. And so I found in my life that as I learned, my appetite to learn was often slowed down until my experience in walking in what I'd learned had caught up. Then I was able to move ahead and learn more things. Amen. So that's the teacher shows up as a youngster in that ability to learn, might be in someone's life because they love studying, but they have to learn how to get out the front, put together a teaching, and then impart it to others in love without any put down. You never say to people, why well, didn't you know that? What's wrong with you? I knew that. That's, that's not it. It's, hmm, have you ever thought about this? Maybe you could look at it a different way. Have you thought about this? And you teach people and serve them with knowledge rather than berating them and proving that you're more superior. Okay, so the next one that will wash your car today is the server. Take it away, Rosanna. Well, here I am at the car washing committee meeting. Just made it as I started. Man, this is taking forever. Minutes of the last meeting. Mover, seconder. We haven't even started the part about washing the car yet. Uh, excuse me, madam, chairperson. Um, I just have to go out for a couple of minutes. May I be excused? Thanks. Oh, better get back into the meeting. So, you've finished the meeting about washing the car? Well, 
while you've been talking about it, I've been doing it. Yep, I've already washed the car and all the others in the car park as well. Now, can we go home, please? It's all done. In this scripture, the Apostle Paul says, or ministry, also translated serving, let us use it in our serving. So it's a gift, but you've got to put it into action. Now, the person with this gift has a supernatural energy to get tasks done. Let me illustrate. We sometimes go to a tiny little micro church up in the country. And in the country, there's this one particular lady. And I'll never forget the first time I saw her in operation because she's a pretty good talker and she was walking around talking. And then she just clicks and she said, right, we've got to pack up the chairs. And there was a few people trying to pack up the chairs, slowly progressing. And this lady ran through the building, had all those chairs packed up in about 10 seconds, loaded all the equipment out for me to put in the car. And I'm all talking about a young woman here. And she had it all done. And she said, okay, that's all done. And she just went back into her other personality and eventually wandered off home. But when she clicked into being a server, she got so much done. It's like when we had the Bible college, we had one man in there. Now he's a marriage celebrant today, but he had the gift of serving and it manifested or it, it, it surfaced when we were doing concerts in schools and we'd finish the concert and a few people were starting to carry the equipment out. And this guy would just grab the equipment and put it in the trailer. In about 10 seconds, he had the trailer loaded. And I just used to sit there and look at him amazed and thinking, that is a gift from God. So in Rosanna's story, the person with that kind of gift and ability can get bored in a meeting talking about doing tasks. They just want to see it done. So she jumped up, went out, washed the cars, got back in before they'd even finished talking about it. And that serving gift is a blessing. But those of us around that gift need to understand that that gift is there for a benefit of everybody. And those around that gift need to realize something very important. When the server is completely task oriented, focused on what they are doing, you might not be able to get through to them. They might be so focused, but their mind is open to the work of the enemy who will throw in accusations and all kind of thoughts like, how come I'm the only one doing this? Where's everybody else when I'm here? Why do they all let me down? They're all in there drinking tea and coffee. All kinds of accusations come. And so you've got to surround the servers in your life or in your church with encouragement, heaps of appreciation, cover them with prayer and make sure they know that you love them and that you absolutely value what they do. And often it won't take much to keep them motivated, but you must encourage them. Don't ever criticize them because they can't do what you can do. Because when they do what they can, they are a blessing that only God could ever have come up with. How else could a, a woman of that age zoom around the church, pack up all the chairs in a couple of minutes flat while everybody else is just trying to struggle through the first one or the first stack? It's amazing. Okay, Rosanna, the next one she has for us is The Exhorter. Hey, bestie, how you doing? Woo, how are you? Come to my place Saturday Arvo for a car washing party. Woo, yeah, wear waterproof clothes, bring your bathers. After we wash the car together, we're having a barbie and a pool party. Tell everyone. Hey, bestie, how are you? Come to my place for a car washing party on Saturday. Bring plenty of buckets, water cannons and party food. Tell everyone, the more the better. Yep. Hey, bestie, how you doing? Get ready for a huge water fight and party at my house. While we're at it, the car might get a bit cleaner. <laughs> awesome. Hey, bestie, my place, Saturday Arvo, huge water fight, lots of suds, barbecue and pool. Bring everyone. This is going to be the best party of the year. Okay, well, I suppose everybody's seen one of these people in action. They're a party waiting for somewhere to happen. You'll notice that the exhorter calls everybody bestie. In other words, my best friend. You can really only ever have one best friend, but the exhorter is everybody's friend. And they think everybody is their friend. They wouldn't be sure if anybody was against them. They want to be everybody's friend. They're a party waiting to start. Notice how the progression went from a car washing party to a water fight. <laughs> 
because in her mind, she just wants everybody happy, everybody together. They love crowds. They love groups of people. We had one exhorter in Bible college and one day I was teaching and for some reason, a number of the students were away. They might have been at a youth event or something. And she sat down in the college and she said, where is everybody? And I kept saying, you're here, I'm here, what's the problem? She goes, where is everybody? I've been ripped off. She felt ripped off because there wasn't a big crowd around her. It, to her, it wasn't about what can I learn? You know, a teacher probably thought, oh, this is great. I'll get more information than anybody else. But to the exhorter, she was devastated that the classroom was emptier than usual because she's all about crowds, doing it together. I've got another friend that's an exhorter and oh, lots of them and, and they are amazing people. And if you're having an outreach party at your house, or well, like Matthew did, you might get a server in to help with the meals and to help prepare the room. You've got someone with hospitality to make everybody at home, but you need an exhorter to get the atmosphere going, amen? You need an exhorter. They are great on the front door. They are great in fellowship meetings. Exhorters are brilliant and they're great in the workplace. There might be a salesman or something like that. You need to understand the exhorter to acknowledge them and be friends with them. And don't forget to encourage the exhorter. Tell them they are amazing. Woohoo! Speak back to them the way they speak to you. Amen. You don't say to the exhorter, and how are you feeling today? How does that make you feel? Oh, that's no good. Because they don't talk that language. You might as well talk to them in Swahili. They want to know that you're happy, that you're their best friend, that you love them. Amen. doesn't matter if they forget who you are the next day. That's irrelevant. Now, Rosanna's going to show one more in this list of motivational gifts. And this one is the facilitator, which I'll give you a heads up. Facilitate means to make things easy. Their job is to put everybody into the role where their gift shines. Used wrongly, it can go very pear-shaped very quickly. I've got some stories afterwards, but Rosanna's going to show you right now. Hmm. Seems like we need to get Mrs. Incapacitated's car wash this Saturday. I'll text back the pastor and tell him, leave it to me. Hi. Can you get to Mrs. Incapacitated on Saturday morning? Pick up her car and take it to the church. Thanks. Hey, how you doing? Can you grab five buckets, some cleaning sponges and cloths and take them to church Saturday morning? Awesome, thanks. Hey, how you doing? Can you be at church on Saturday morning to help wash Mrs. Incapacitated's car and bring your hose? Thanks. Hey, can you come to church on Saturday morning and bring some morning tea for everyone? Awesome, thanks. Hey, how you doing? Saturday... Saturday morning? Yeah, yeah, let's go out for a cuppa. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but on the way back, I just have to drop into the church to make sure everything's working out okay. Thanks, Rosanna. Isn't it interesting in this story, the facilitator was good, and at the end showed the weakness of a facilitator because the facilitator's gift makes things easier, but the objective is to make it easier for Jesus' vision to come to pass until people understand that, the facilitator uses their gift to make life easier for themselves. We know one young mum, as she was then, was a facilitator. And her young boys never went anywhere without a big backpack. Because <laughs> if they were going to play a game or do anything while they were away, even just about their baby bottles, they carried it with them on their own backpack. She would sit there and say, come on, boys, pack up your things. Put them in your backpack, let's go. And she had their whole family organised like that. We have one other friend that's like that. She's got, oh, four boys. I think she organises them and she can do music and sing. And this perfectly calm family, she has them so organised. Another lady we know is a facilitator. And then they were going to have a ladies meeting. And she did exactly what happened in the car washing thing today. The facilitator said, oh, you want me to help do that? Yeah, no worries, I can do that. Bang, she got on the phone in about three minutes. She said, yeah, I've got that done. And we never saw her on the day. She just rang up and organized everybody else to do it. But the right use of the gift is done conscientiously, looking at other people and seeing what they're talented at, what they're gifted at, and then fitting them 
in where they're suited and releasing them through training, through encouragement, through good follow-up to be able to fulfill their purpose. And often you find the leaders of mega churches are facilitators and they're probably exhorters as well. A facilitator and exhorter mixed into their gifts and they are very, very good at putting people in. And I remember when we worked at the big church in Dandenong, where the pastor was not only running the big church, he was a state president, he is the, in the national executive, he was helping to run the missions and something else. And when he chose people and put them into their roles, I studied what happened to try to learn because I thought, I don't think I would ever have thought of putting that person there. And when it worked, it was amazing. And I thought, how does he know who to get and where to put them? And I realized it's a facilitator's gift. Just to look at it a different way, maybe humorous. I've seen a facilitator at the Gold Coast, a different one again. And we were having a conference and he had organized a lot of people to bring food. And I went into that room and I must be a little bit of mercy in me because I looked at that food and I could see what was popular and what was being eaten and what wasn't. And all I thought was, how would the person feel who made this one and no one's eating it? And my brother-in-law, I could tell, was feeling the same. So nobody else ate any of that, but I did and my brother-in-law did. And I think I went back and had a second one. And then the facilitator said to me, why did you eat that? I said, because of the person who made it. He goes, well, that's strange. I just usually tell him, don't make that again. <laughs> it wasn't that he was concerned about their feelings. He just wanted to put it together in a way that it worked. So he just got them, don't make that again, make this, you know. So the facilitator seems to be able to tell people what to do, but we must learn it's got to be used correctly with conscientious love to see people come into a gift and into a role perhaps with which they are not familiar or shy, but it's right. And so we have to ease them in and help them fulfill their purpose so that everybody is blessed. Amen. Well, that's enough for today. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Let's believe God together now that in our church, in our lives, our families, and our workplaces, we never have anybody misemployed. Amen. We never have anybody in the wrong place. By the way, the statistics are, or used to be, that in the workplace, 80% of employees are misemployed according to their gifts and their talents. Let's never have this the case in the church. Let's get everybody into their gift. Because remember, in your gift, you operate with God's supernatural energy. You come under that umbrella of grace and under the covering of the oversight. And you have an ability to work. God is for us, operating in his strength, his ability, and it operates by the gift he put in your life before you came here as a baby. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much today for the differing gifts you've put in each one of us. And we pray today, Father, that a discovery would begin to take place in our lives, that we would each recognize these gifts, not only in ourselves, but Lord, that you would give us each the love to be able to help others be pointed out what their gift is so they can learn about it. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just give you praise for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just as we're finishing, I want to encourage you with this book. This book is called Unwrap Your Gifts. It's written by my sister, and she's one of the best teachers I've ever come across on these motivational gifts. She mentions all the other gifts in here as well. You can get this book on Lulu. I'll hopefully put that on the screen and or you can just contact us over Facebook or by phone and we can help you get a copy. It's a great idea to understand your gift and to do it. Now, before we conclude, one more question, which is, have you been born again? Because remember, none of these things work properly unless we are born again. Let's read another view of being born again here from the Bible. So here we have the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 starting halfway through verse 3, sharing with us the gospel. Let's listen to what he says. Christ died for our sins, as the scripture says. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture says. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. 
Then it was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I'd been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. And I can put my hand up there too. I met Jesus. I know he's alive. And this is the proof that salvation is real, that there is life after death and eternity is true and that everything Jesus taught about us is right because he's the only one that ever came back from the dead to demonstrate that what he taught in his own philosophy works. How do we receive and benefit from what he's done? Again, it's done with a prayer. And in that prayer, we have to state that we believe in our heart that Jesus rose from the dead. And we have to confess out of our mouth that Jesus is Lord, implying that he is the Lord of my life. And then we put our faith in him. We receive his new birth. We receive a complete new start. Our old life is gone with all of its sin and we become a new creation in Jesus. Let's pray together. So repeat this prayer after me to receive his new birth today. And I want to encourage everybody in the room to say it. Or if you're by yourself, just say it after me. Say, Jesus, Jesus. thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you died in my place. You carried my sin. You carried my old life and died and was buried. Today, Jesus, I believe you rose from the dead for my justification and I receive today by faith everything you died for and regained through your resurrection. Today, I receive the new birth. I receive being a new creation. I confess Jesus is my Lord. I follow the Good Shepherd's voice. And I walk in the Spirit. I'm born again. And Jesus is my Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks a lot today. If you said that prayer for the first time today, remember, it's so vitally important to tell someone. If there's no one there you can tell, ring us up, write to us on Facebook. We've seen a couple of people writing back to us, telling us about, saying the prayer, and we pray for them and believe God and keep sending teaching. And so today, let's all make a new start and let's look into what our gift is, speak to people in the room, and we'll see you next week. God bless you. Thanks for being part of this online service.